The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. It's a bit of a shocking question. Could infertility become the new normal for men by the middle of this century? Tonight, the real concerns about men's reproductive health. Then we'll find out how this pandemic is shaping mental health care in Ontario now and going forward. It's Wednesday, May the 5th, and that's all ahead on The Agenda. Studies have shown that sperm counts in men living in Western countries have dropped by almost 60% over the past half century. Why is this happening? And should we be concerned that we're on track to an existential crisis? With us to explore those questions in Edinburgh, Scotland, Richard Sharp, professor at the MRC Center for Reproductive Health at the University of Edinburgh. In Chapel Hill, North Carolina, Linda Birnbaum, former director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and National Toxicology Program, and a scholar in residence at Duke University's Nicholas School of the Environment. And on Manhattan Island in New York City, Shauna Swan, author of Countdown, how our modern world is threatening sperm counts, altering male and female reproductive development, and imperiling the future of the human race. She is also a professor of environmental medicine and public health at the Icon School of Medicine at New York's Mount Sinai Hospital. And it's a pleasure to have you three on the agenda tonight. Sean, I'm gonna spend a few minutes with you just off the top to set up the premise for our discussion. And in doing so, here are some numbers and a quote from your book to get us started. In 2017, you examined the findings from 185 studies involving nearly 43,000 men that had been conducted over a 38 year span. And you found that between the years 1973 and 2011, sperm concentration, in other words, the number of sperm per milliliter of semen dropped more than 52% among random men in Western countries. Meanwhile, the total sperm count fell by more than 59%. And you write, the current state of reproductive affairs can't continue much longer without threatening human survival. Now that all sounds extremely alarming, but genuinely, how concerned do you think we ought to be? Well, obviously I'm concerned because I wrote that <laughs> and um, I, I feel that um, the current state of um, reproductive health is really um, pretty serious. And the number, uh, when we last looked at the sperm concentration, there were um, 47 million sperm per milliliter median worldwide. <clears throat> so that number dropping from 99 in um, 1973, um, that's a huge decline. And what that means is that at 47, we're very close to 40. So 40 million sperm per milliliter sounds like a lot of sperm. It is a lot of sperm, but it turns out that when a man's concentration drops below 40, then a lot of things kick in. His um, uh, probability of conceiving goes down, the amount, the number for the per cycle pregnancy rate goes down. And actually he himself experiences um, an earlier age of death because there's a lifetime consequence of this poor sperm count. So now that we are uh, arguably at around 40, because that, you know, if the decline continued, which we don't know yet, um, uh, then we would be certainly be uh, below 40 million per milliliter and in that area of impaired fertility. And, and so with a lot of the world in that place and seeing the increase in assisted reproduction, um, decreases in total fertility rate, I believe that we're in a serious problem. This is a problem in the developed world. Is it also a problem in the developing world? We have much less data, much fewer studies from developing countries. Um, that's because these sperm count studies take a certain level of technology and sophistication, um, but we're getting more of them and we're hoping in an update that we're doing, we'll get more information. But the fertility decline, which is the number of children born per woman, that has been worldwide at about the same rate. So the total number of children born 
1960 was five per woman or couple worldwide, and that has dropped to 2.4 worldwide in 2019. So that's the same roughly rate of decline in fertility and sperm count, and it is worldwide for fertility. It's going on in every country. And many countries, particularly Western countries, are now below replacement. So this is not just a Western problem. The thesis of this conversation now having been established, let's bring our other two guests in here and get some reaction from them as to this information we've just received. Uh, Linda, why don't you start us off here? Uh, Shauna has written that this is a global existential crisis. What do you think? I tend to agree with Shauna. I, about 15 years ago, I actually, there was a movie some people may remember called Children of Men, which posited that there was extremely low fertility and it was a huge problem. I think that that is, you know, for the world, I'm not sure overall with well over seven to 8 billion people on our planet, I'm not sure that um, fertility is a problem when you look at it that way, but when you look certainly at an individual couple or individual people, it is a problem. And I think that the data is growing and extensive, that it's not only male fertility, which has decreased, but also female fertility as well. Richard, what say you? Well, I think there's a, a major problem with male reproductive health for sure. Um, I think that the global reduction in couple fertility is an issue where we have two factors at play. The, the one that we're concerned about now, which is adverse changes in sperm counts in men, and thus in couple fertility, and societal changes, which have had a a huge impact on couple fertility when they when they're trying for children and also how many they want to end up having so it can be difficult to disentangle those two but i think that the biggest impact of having lots of men with low sperm counts is another societal change and that is the delay of couples in trying for children until the female partner is in her 30s that's becoming now almost the most common uh, situation, because at that time, fertility in the female is much reduced compared with when she's in her early 20s. And that means that sperm count becomes a much bigger player in terms of whether or not she will get pregnant. And if sperm counts are low, then you can see what the problem will be. They say it's always a good idea to listen to your urologist. So we are going to hear from two of them right now. Dr. Paul Turek said in 2018, over the last 100 years of industrialization, we are living better, longer, and we're certainly fatter. We're not cavemen anymore. We've industrialized ourselves. We probably need less sperm. If you're married and you're a captive audience, demand is low and maybe you don't need it. Maybe that's what the drop is adjusting for. Maybe, maybe it's evolutionarily fine. Maybe the drop plateaus here. Dr. Peter Schlegel, the chair of urology at the Weill Cornell Medicine and New York Presbyterian says, if you had a decrease in sperm count in the 50 to 60% range, we would expect the proportion of men with severe male infertility to be going up astronomically, and we don't see that. Okay, Shauna, do you think the sperm count drop could have hit a plateau and men will still remain relatively fertile? I think that it's possible that it has plateaued and it's certainly going, not to, going to go down forever because you can't have a zero sperm counter concentration. However, um, I would take issue with a statement that the number of uh, infertile men has not gone up dramatically. When I've talked to people who um, are um, running sperm banks and they're repeatedly um, reporting that there, and this has been published, that there are fewer um, men who are able to qualify for, with adequate sperm for the sperm bank. And many sperm banks have actually closed. One I worked with in uh, University of Rochester actually closed when the number of, of donors that qualified what became too low. So I believe that um, we are seeing um, it becoming more difficult to get men uh, uh, with adequate sperm for sperm banking. We're seeing um, it being harder for couple, more couples going into assisted reproduction and the need for those sperm banks is increasing. And those two are coming together now and causing a really serious problem. Richard, what's your view on whether or not the sperm count drop has finally plateaued? 
Well, I think the, evidence, the best evidence we've got is from uh, studies in Denmark of young men, and they suggest that in Denmark, which has got the lowest sperm counts in the world on average, um, that they have plateaued over the last 15 years, that they're not going any lower. Um, so if Denmark is, is leading the way, if you like, then we can expect that things are not going to get any worse. But, uh, but I disagree with those statements that, that things are not bad. I'm, I'm complete agreement with Shana here, because we know that there's throughout Northern Europe, then one in five, one in six young men of reproductive age has a sperm count, not 40 million per mil, but less than 20 million per mil. And we know that at that level, that is going to have a very serious impact on how long it takes to get a, their partner pregnant, if they can do that at all. And as I say, if the female partner is in her 30s, then your time is not on their side. So you're playing a very bad game there. And that's why you get an increasing referral to assisted reproduction, which is very traumatic. Linda, your view on that? I would totally agree with Richard and with Shana. I think that, first of all, I should say, I'm a believer in prevention. Um, it's always better than treatment and cures if you can do it. And I think that the rapid decline over 50 years, and even if it has now plateaued, and in Denmark, if it's down in approaching 20 um, million sperm, I, I, I mean, I think we're at the point that we need to think about what can we do to prevent not only further decline, but potentially reverse it. And I think it's important to realize that our genes just don't change that quickly. Um, evolution works over eons, not necessarily over a generation. I do agree with Richard's comment, which I think is really important, that the societal changes are major and have had a very, very significant impact. But you know, using Denmark as the example, I believe well over 20% of pregnancies in Denmark involve assisted re use of assisted reproductive technology. And that use has increased dramatically, not only in Denmark, not only in Northern Europe, but certainly in the United States and Canada as well. So I think we need to begin to look at what are some of the drivers of this, um, of this precipitous drop in sperm count and an increase in some other male reproductive abnormalities as well. Let's do that right now. Shauna, in your book, as we look at why this is happening, you point to a culprit known as the endocrine disrupting chemicals. What are they? Okay, I will answer that question and then I wanna interject something. So endocrine disrupting chemicals are a broad class of chemicals that have the ability to interfere with our endogenous hormones. Um, but I just wanna say, in my book, and I right now will say, I certainly recognize that there are many causes for this decline, and certainly there are important lifestyle causes, um, which we can go into, um, and these have also shifted over time, increase, increasing obesity, stress, alcohol consumption, and so on and so forth. Um, and there is also the, the, the question of, um, desire uh, for a child that we want to consider. But let's turn to endocrine disrupting chemicals. So um, uh, the classes that we're thinking about, um, I think we could broadly characterize them as um, non-persistent and persistent. I have done most of my work with the non-persistent chemicals and particularly the chemicals um, known as phthalates, which are plasticizers, which are chemicals in plastic that make plastic soft and flexible. They're also in personal care products um, and they're actually ubiquitous in our daily life. Um, then there's the, the phenols, particularly the bisphenols, um, which make plastic hard. So you can think about that, you know, trade off of between hard and soft plastic. And then we have the, the barriers, if you will, the, the linings, the linings of tin cans, the water repellents, the linings on paper, the can coatings in cans. So linings are, are, are also contain many of these chemicals. Um, and then we have the flame retardants and the pesticides. So, um, but as I say, my work has been primarily on the phthalates and to some extent on the bisphenols. All right, Linda, can I get you to follow up and, and uh, ask you whether you think these endocrine disrupting chemicals are the cause for the decline in male fertility? I would say I believe that endocrine disrupting compounds are a cause. 
they are one of multiple causes. Our, our hormone system is extremely important to who we are and our normal physiology as adults, for sure. But during development, our endocrine system is essential for normal development. And when you have exposure that occurs in utero, um, an early life stage, changes can occur which are not reversible. And I think that some of the effects that we are seeing, especially from these endocrine disruptors, which act at extremely low concentrations, um, may, um, many of them are occurring before we're even born. And in fact, there's now evidence for some of it um, being impacts from your grandparents' exposure that we are just seeing the effects of now. Richard, your view on that? Well, the one thing that I feel strongly on is that uh, endocrine disruption is likely to be very important in the, the uh, ontology of uh, male reproductive disorders. In other words, that it's disruption of normal androgen exposure during fetal development of the male. We know that that's probably going to be during the first trimester of pregnancy, very early on, somewhere between uh, 11 to 14 weeks. And uh, so it's factors that affect that process. So where I would disagree with Shanna is that I don't think that the evidence that phthalates may be having an effect in humans, they can do it in uh, certain laboratory animals uh, at much higher levels. But I think it is factors that may be impacting that process. It may be environmental chemicals. It may be lifestyle, dietary effects. It's extremely difficult to study because it's occurring when the fetus is, is, is literally that big. And you've got to think that that's the whole fetus. So the testes in the male fetus at that stage are producing enough testosterone to fully set up normal male reproductive development. If you don't get enough testosterone at that stage, then that's curtains. You, you cannot revisit it at a later stage and recover. Just before so I get Shauna to comment so on that. Sure, just before I get Shauna to comment on that, you used the word phthalates, I think. Do you wanna just explain what those are? So, so, so that they're one of the um, uh, compounds that Shana referred to that she has studied. They are a plasticizer and uh, they're everywhere in our environment. So we are all exposed uh, whether we want to be or not. Um, and, and diet, our diet is another important exposure for means of exposure to phthalates. Okay, Shawna, you wanna come back on that? Um, I agree with what Richard just said. Um, I think where we disagree is <clears throat> on the ability of phthalates to alter male reproductive development in utero. And I, <clears throat> I have shown in repeated studies, uh, as have other people, that measured levels of phthalates in the woman's urine that is urinary metabolite levels of phthalates that are known to be antiandrogens are significantly associated with endpoints with which Richard and others in his field have called the phthalate syndrome. So I, in our studies, first in 2005, 2008, 2015, and then in other studies for other phthalates, for example, in Sweden, um, we have repeatedly shown that there is an association, significant association between the mother's exposure to these chemicals and changes in the male genitals, including um, shortened intergenital distance, which is a marker of the phthalate syndrome, the perineal length, if you will, the size of the penis, the descent of the testes. And um, so I feel that these studies establish the existence of the phthalate syndrome in humans. And Richard, do you see a definitive link between these plastics, the phthalates, and the problem we're talking about here? No, I, based on animal studies, which we've been probably the leading lab in, in the world on, then you would say that Shanna is completely correct to be uh, concerned. But to, to induce phthalate syndrome in rats, you need to expose them to phthalates about 10 to 100,000 times the level to which you and I are exposed. Um, if you expose at human exposure levels, you get no effects. Uh, you can only interfere with testosterone with very high levels. 
And in humans, if you look at directly at fetal human testes um, and ask the question, do phthalates interfere with testosterone production by those testes? The answer is they do not. Um, so we come back to Shana's epidemiological studies, which of course can, an epidemiological study can never prove cause and effect. So my way of looking at it is that there is something else there, which is having the effects that Shana is interested in, the reproductive effects and reduction in anogenital distance. And it's also increasing exposure to phthalates. But I don't think that the phthalates are causing the effects. But Linda, I think, Linda, I've heard you say in the past that you can't say this causes this. You can say this is associated with this. Have I got that right, that you're not seeing a definitive crystal clear link as well? I would say that I disagree with Richard and I'm more supportive of Shauna's um, studies. I think, first of all, nature is inherently conservative. When it works something out in other species, we tend to see the same thing in people. I would say that the phthalate effect is not only seen in rats and mice, it's been observed in other animal species as well. I think that the exposure issue is one that is often not fully understood. You always have to expose small little animals like a rat or a mouse to a much higher delivered dose than you would in people in order to get the same internal, what we call body burden, or in this case, we might say concentration in the fetal testis, um, for example. I think there are some, there are criteria, not criteria, but considerations that are often used to decide whether there is actually a cause effect relationship in epidemiology studies. Um, they're known as the Bradford Hill considerations. And when many of them are satisfied, such as um, biological plausibility, which can be provided by both mechanistic animal studies or human studies, like Richard mentioned, that can occur using human cultured human fetal testis, for example. I think, and, and you see, for example, Shauna's data has been able to, her epidemiology has looked at some prospective longitudinal kinds of studies. You're not looking at the levels, for example, of phthalates in the, in the mothers when the baby's born, you're looking during key windows of susceptibility that occur during um, gestation. And I should say, do I think phthalates are the only source of the, the decreased um, sperm counts that we're seeing? And the answer to that would be no, I don't think so. I think there are multiple kinds of compounds that have been shown to impact uh, quality and quantity of sperm. Some of them are things that we traditionally think of as some of the endocrine disruptors like phthalates or the bisphenols or or things like some of the PCBs or the dioxins. But I think we need to, to understand that there are multiple kinds of compounds that may be impacting on um, male fertility at this well, point in time. Okay, Richard, since you're on the, the downside of this 2-1 score here, maybe I should give you the last <laughs> word on, on just this segment, uh, this part of our segment. Uh, what are you apparently not seeing that the other two are seeing? Well, one of the ways that I look at it is to ask and say, when we look at the world around us and the health changes that occurred over the time span that we're interested in, say the last 50 to 70 years, what has been the driver for the major health changes? And the answer is unequivocally changes in our diet, particularly eating too much, eating too much of the wrong things and not eating enough of the good things. So if you were going to ask, if as sperm counts have gone down, what is the most likely factor to have impacted that? I would start with diets. I wouldn't start with chemicals which we are exposed to at very, very low levels. I'm not saying that they're, they're not playing a role, but what we've done is to do it the other way around. So I don't think we've been looking enough at diet. And we know that in humans, the way uh, reproductive development is set up and driven in humans is fundamentally completely different to what it is in rodents. We're, we're all using androgens, testosterone, to do it, but what drives the testosterone in a, in a laboratory animal is completely different from what drives it in a human. 
And what drives it in a human comes from the placenta, and we know that that can be impacted by lifestyle, diet, and other factors. So I, I, I would simply make a plea. Let's look at more at that, please, because what we don't want to do is to spend a huge amount of money and research um, banning chemicals, for example, and to find that there's no benefit. So we need to actually put the get the right guy in jail, not the wrong guy. So that's my view. Okay, let's let's move on to another angle here, and I want to move, uh, I guess, sort of from epidemiology to uh, psychology, because many people connect low testosterone count with being less masculine. Might not be fair, but people do that. Uh, Shauna, to you first. What psychological effect do you think all of this is having on men today? Well. Um... So you say low testosterone count is associated uh, with feelings of less, you know, being less masculine. Certainly most men do not know their testosterone count. They can know their sperm count. Unfortunately, most men don't know that, which by the way, I think they should, but um, any evidence uh, that they need a testosterone replacement, they need to go to ART uh, and so on um, is definitely assisted reproduction, um, that, uh, that they, that they, um, feel less, uh, less a man, um, that, and, and, um, for this reason, by the way, I think men have not owned up to their role in, um, the difficulties that a couple may be having conceiving. They haven't owned up to their role in uh, multiple miscarriages when they do play a role. And I want, and I think even though it's difficult, men have to step up and say, we are equal partners in this problem. Men and women bear responsibility equally, if you will, and the woman should not be blamed as she has been, by the way, for centuries, uh, been blamed for the inability to conceive. Goes back to Henry VIII, if not before. Exactly. <laughs> uh, Linda, let me get you on that. The psychological effect on men, you think, by, uh, by all of what we're talking about here? I think most men are unaware of it. I think most men, as Shanna said, it's not you go to your doctor and you get your, your clinical chemistry done. It, testosterone is not something that's real reason you know, often done. I think if men find out, and when they do find out that they their testosterone may say be at the low end of normal or below the normal range. I think that concerns many men. And I think that there has been an increase overall in male reproductive issues. And I think that clearly has a psychological effect on men. Richard, your view? Well, I think men are inherently very insecure. Um, you know, we're, 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 we're designed to be competitive and, and successful and I think that anything that sort of appears to interfere with that is bad news as far as men's security and their own feelings of self-worth uh, come along. So the idea of having a lower sperm count that you're infertile, um, God forbid, have lower testosterone, then I think we just do not handle that well. We will not come out and talk about it. You don't see many men putting up their hands and saying, I've got a fertility problem. <laughs> women, I, when women have a fertility problem, they they seek help about it. Men won't even admit it. So I think we it's a, it's a crisis from that point of view. We need a fundamental change in the way that men confront this issue and all ish aspects of uh, to do with masculinity, etc. And and we're, we're we are beginning to deal with that for other reasons than Me Too and things like that. So, but this is part of the same story to some extent. Shauna, let me try this follow-up with you. Do you see a connection between lowered testosterone levels and people identifying as gender fluid or non-binary? Well, that's a really difficult question, Steve, isn't it? Let me just back up and say that environmental chemicals cause problems of sexual development in animals. That can be shown in the laboratory, that can be shown uh, in the wild. Uh, frogs with ovaries and testes in the same animal can be produced by exposure to atrazine and so on. Um, so there's no question that chemicals in the environment can cause these problems in these problems in humans. But 
we're not really talking about problems of gender, you know, of sexual development. We're talking about something in your mind. Do I feel like I've been born in the wrong body? Do I feel like I, though I have a biological sex, a gen genetic sex of XY, I really should have been assigned XX. This is a different problem. And I don't think this is a problem that animals can help us with because we can't ask them what's in their mind. We can't ask them what, gender would they prefer to be so i'm not sure we're going to get help from richard's <laughs> experiments or from any experiments on this and so i think we need a new set of um kind of science to address this and i don't think we're there yet okay in our remaining moments here linda start us off on this do you think anything can be done about this if by this you mean problems in male fertility i yes. would hope so because i think if you um are agree with the Linear trend, which is showing continued decreases, we are getting men in, into a huge area with fertility. Um, we don't have all the data from the developing world, but the limited data that we have suggests that um, that data is supportive of what we're seeing in the developed world. I think that environmental chemicals have become, and endocrine disruptors are ubiquitous. We are all exposed all the time to a soup of these. It is not one chemical at a time. And I do believe that they are having an impact on our health. I totally agree with Richard that our diet is a major confounder of what we're trying to understand. But I, can, we, I think we can say, first of all, many of these environmental chemicals, a major out of exposure is often through the diet. And again, it's not one, it's a plethora of compounds to which we're exposed. One point I would like to make just as a something to think about is when we talk about phthalates, they are not only male reproductive toxicants. They also it can impact females. And something we haven't talked about at all here is that they are impacting the brains of our children. And I think that is another problem that we need to be addressing. <laughs> Richard, do you think governments are seized enough of this issue to be prepared to do anything about it? I, I don't think so, no. I think that um, largely male or couple infertility is viewed as a problem solved. Uh, and it's been viewed that way ever since uh, we developed effective means of assisted reproduction. Now, and I should say that those effective means, they, they, they're only effective for the minority of people who seek help. Um, so they're not that successful. But I think that that's what they've done is engendered the view that we, we've got it all solved. If you've got a fertility problem, if he's got a low sperm count, we just get them together, we get the sperm, and we inject it into the egg, and there's your, the problem solved. That is not the reality. Um, assisted reproduction is bruising, traumatic, and expensive, and it's not hugely successful for the majority. Um, so I think that you get what you pay for. We haven't put enough money into male reproductive research, for sure. Lots of reasons for that, including male reluctance to put their hands up. But you get what you pay for, and that's what we're seeing at the moment. Get what you pay for. You could say that for so many things. Okay, Shauna, going to give you the last word on this. What can be done? Okay, I think the first thing that has to be done is that people have to um, really face this problem, and particularly men have to recognize that they are playing a role and that they um, should consider the possibility of their low sperm counts get tested, if necessary, bank sperm, freeze eggs, because I think this is a really a serious problem that people have to act on personally, then governments have to test these chemicals. They are currently in the United States not tested before they go into market largely. Um, and um, we have to test all those legacy chemicals that we let in because they've been used forever. They're not tested. And we have to test in the ways that people are exposed. As Richard pointed out, animals are exposed to very high doses in tests. We are exposed to low doses. So that's what we should be testing. So adequate testing, adequate monitoring, and um, awareness of people that this is a problem so that they can demand uh, what Richard said, they have to demand the government to put up the dollars to address this problem before it's too late. Well, Linda, apropos of the name of the movie that you started off our conversation with about a half an hour ago, I've seen that movie and it's horrifying. So let's hope we get a handle on this before that becomes reality. What's the name of that picture again, in case anybody wants to watch it? Children of Men. 
Scary. Okay, Richard Sharp, Linda Birnbaum, Shauna Swan, great of all of you to join us on TVO tonight for this most interesting conversation. Appreciate it very much. In addition to the obvious health care crisis caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, the toll on mental health continues to mount on people and on the system. With us for his insight, let's welcome back Dr. Quam McKenzie, CEO at the health policy nonprofit Wellesley Institute and a professor of psychiatry at the University of Toronto. He's also a member of the Ontario COVID-19 Science Advisory Tables Mental Health Working Group. Quam, it's great to see you again. How are you managing through all this? Great to see you, Steve, and uh, I'm managing fine. I just need to say that uh, I'm not representing the science uh, table at the moment, the mental health table. Um, so everything that I'm saying here is uh, my own opinion, not theirs. We are happy to put that on the record. When this pandemic ends, Quam, and we fully flatten the COVID curve, are we going to have a massive mental health curve to flatten after that? My opinion is yes, because um, yes, we started by thinking that we need to flatten the curve and now we've got a different curve that we need to uh, look at and we need to get in front of, really. Um, there are about four reasons, in my opinion, why uh, we're going to have uh, significantly higher rates of mental health problems. Uh, one is the COVID infection itself. A lot of people uh, who get COVID then get a mental health diagnosis. Uh, the second is that the um, uh, lockdowns and the disruptions to people's lives have led to uh, anxiety uh, and depression in some people. Uh, the third is that we've had a significant disruption in uh, access to medical care, and that includes mental health care. And so we're seeing some uh, people relapsing because of that, other people worried about physical illnesses that aren't being treated. And last, uh, but not least, uh, obviously, we've got an economic problem that we're going to have to deal with. And we know that financial insecurity and poverty are very linked to rates of mental health problems. OK, that's a good list. Let's let's follow up with what specific issues you are seeing on the rise as a result of those four things that you just enumerated. Well, I think in the general population, we're seeing quite a lot of um, anxiety and mild depression and stress. Uh, we're also seeing increasing rates of substance use and, uh, you know, uh, opioid deaths are on the rise. Uh, then we're seeing uh, relapses of existing mental health problems uh, and we're seeing quite a lot of complex grief. So people who've lost loved ones uh, and dealing with the grief of that, sometimes not able to get to um, uh, to funerals and uh, not really complete the process. Uh, then for um, uh, people who uh, are sort of frontline workers and other people working in the pandemic, we're seeing quite a lot of trauma, we're seeing burnout and we're seeing stress and mental health problems in those people as well. So uh, we're seeing quite a lot of uh, problems there. Uh, that are growing over time. One thing I hear anecdotally, and I'll, I'll get you to either confirm or deny that it's in fact the case, uh, suicides and domestic abuse, yes or no? Uh, then the, 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 it's surprisingly the jury's out. So uh, we expect an increased uh, rate of suicides. We have seen uh, increased suicidal thoughts uh, but the data that I've seen in Ontario is equivocal about an actual rise in completed suicides. Uh, so there's, that's the equivocal. Domestic abuse most definitely increased rates of domestic abuse, uh, going with people being in more confined uh, spaces together and the lockdown, going with the stress, going with the unemployment, going with uh, the increased substance misuse. And those are not to give excuses for increased domestic uh, abuse, uh, but just uh, the context in which uh, we'd expect increases to happen. I guess I should ask the, the logical follow-up question, which is, is it all male on female? 
I don't know, but uh, uh, domestic abuse is not all male on female. It is mostly male on female. Uh, but when we're thinking about domestic abuse, uh, we're uh, clearly thinking that the, the biggest problem is male on female. But we also have to think of uh, abuse in households of uh, LGBTQ youth uh, and uh, other uh, vulnerable people within households. We see abuse on older people within households as well. So domestic abuse, abuse is uh, quite widespread. Uh, the biggest problem is male on female, but um, there are other groups that uh, we have to think about when we're thinking about uh, domestic abuse. Understood. Let me read something that was recently published in the New York Times, and this will highlight one word in particular, and that word is languishing. Languishing uh, is a sense of stagnation and emptiness, and it might be the dominant emotion of 2021. It is the neglected middle child of mental health. It's the void between depression and flourishing, the absence of well-being. You don't have symptoms of mental illness, but you're not the picture of mental health either. You're not functioning at full capacity. Languishing dulls your motivation, disrupts your ability to focus, and triples the odds, triples, that you'll cut back on work. It appears to be more common than major depression, and in some ways, it may be a bigger risk factor for mental illness. As soon as I said the word, you said, oh yeah. So I gather this is not news to you. No, this is, uh, it's an interesting uh, fact. One of the things that uh, often happens in um, sort of uh, new systems, situations, pandemics, is things that we know about get given new labels and those new labels get some currency. And that's not to say it's wrong. Uh, and the fact that people identify with the word languishing, I think is very important. Uh, but uh, the description of languishing seems very similar to uh, the description of mild uh, depression, mild anxiety. Uh, and um, it would be interesting to know whether you can uh, differentiate the two. The important thing about it is some people say, well, this isn't important because it's, it's not a serious mental health problem and it doesn't need medical intervention. Uh, and I would say, well, you're right. It, it doesn't possibly, possibly doesn't need medical intervention, but it is an important problem. Um, you know, if we, uh, in a thought economy, in a service economy, um, uh, in the economy we have, um, we, we need people to be uh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed in order to push forwards. Uh, if we want to build back better, we all need to be on our A-game. And uh, languishing, which is uh, mental distress, which is uh, mental, un, uh, um, I, I can say, uh, not uh, mental, is, is mental ill health. I, I didn't want to say that because it sounds so crummy but it's certainly not well-being it's um it's going to be important it, we have to have a strategy to deal with it um it that strategy may not be a medical or clinical strategy uh, but it may be um, online strategies it may be that we have to think about uh, equipping each other with the ability to work through it uh, but it is going to be important that we deal with it. Um, it interestingly, uh, one of the things that I saw on the Statistics Canada website uh, was the impact of the CERB on uh, mental health and mental distress. And you can see a decrease in um, mental well-being in Canada um, as uh, the pandemic started to roll out. Uh, and then, uh, and you can see the impacts, particularly on low income uh, groups. And then as the CERB was rolled out, you can see that uh, a, a significant uptick in mental well-being, and I would imagine in the, also decreasing the amount of languishing uh, that was happening in Canada. So when we're thinking about what we're going to do about languishing, we possibly have to think about how we can equip ourselves. We possibly need to think about what advice we can give uh, uh, ourselves to be more mentally healthy. But we also have to think about the situations we find uh, ourselves in or we put people in and think about what we can do to decrease the worries and decrease the stress 
and give people the opportunity to work through what is a very difficult and traumatic time for a lot of people. Well, that's interesting because, uh, of course, the expression we hear all the time is we can't wait to uh, return to normal. But usually when people say that, they're talking about, I think, you know, getting the economy back to normal, getting our lives in terms of being able to see people back to normal. Uh, I'm not sure people I'm not sure people use the expression in terms of I can't wait to get my mental health back to normal. But it sounds like you're saying we need to factor that into the equation as well. But Quam, we're not going to see another CERB right? The government is just not going to create another CERB. So have you got any other ideas that can be broadly <laughs> applied that could be helpful to the entire country's mental health? And, and I think the, that's a great question. And the idea wasn't that it was the CERB. The learning was that uh, sometimes if you can think of how you can decrease stress and you can increase the predictability of people's lives uh, and you can and people can project forwards into uh, how they see their lives uh, spanning out, uh, that they are less likely to be uh, psychologically unwell. They're li less likely to be so stressed. And so my question would be, when we move forward and when we're trying to build back better, how we think about mental health in all policies, how we think about developing a social contract with Ontarians and Canadians that uh, says, we are going to build back, but we're actually going to think about and look after your mental health while we're doing it. And so when we're thinking about uh, how we're going to um, uh, decrease homelessness, how we're going to uh, deal with the uh, boom, the property boom, how we're going to deal with uh, creating new jobs, uh, we might want to think about uh, whether there's a uh, five or ten percent of that policy that we know can improve people's mental health so we need uh, mental health in all uh, policy and we need a contract with government that says we're going to think about this we're going to start thinking mental health when we're thinking about building back better we seem to have a pretty good handle on the number of positive test cases for COVID 19 we seem to have a pretty good handle on on who is being hit the hardest economically do we also have a good sense about who has been hit in terms of mental health challenges during the course of this pandemic? I think we do. Uh, there are some actually big surveys that have come out of um, uh, Statistics Canada, uh, which have said that, um, and there are some interesting things here, uh, which has said that over 65 year olds who have been hit hard by the pandemic, but haven't had as big a uh, impact on their mental health, uh, whereas people under the age of 65, uh, especially those between the ages of uh, 18 and 55, have had uh, quite big impacts on their mental health, and women have had bigger impacts on their mental health than men. Now, populations such as low-income populations, Indigenous, Black, and other racialized uh, communities that have been very hit hard by COVID have also been hit hard uh, with regards to their mental health problems. And some of that is because uh, our risk of uh, mental health problems is linked to the social determinants of health uh, and uh, uh, populations that are more exposed to the social determinants of health and more exposed to COVID are under greater stress and therefore more likely to have mental health impacts of COVID. Could you compare the state of our preparedness or ability to deliver mental health services before the pandemic hit and where it is today? And I think that's one of the issues about that phrase, you know, we'd really like to get back to normal. Uh, so normal, when we're talking about mental health services in Ontario before the pandemic, was that we had services that were underfunded uh, and uh, we had incredible need that wasn't being met. We had services that uh, were one size fits all and really didn't meet the needs of um, low income and racialized uh, people or indigenous people. And we had services uh, that didn't really meet the needs at all of people who use substances. So if we went back to normal, 
we'd be going back to underfunded, um, poorly coordinated uh, mental health services full of people who are working really hard. We actually have uh, great social workers, great nurses, uh, great outreach workers, great uh, psychiatrists and psychologists out there, uh, but we don't have enough of them. And we didn't have a coherent system that offered uh, people equitable care in a way that was fitting of a high income country. So if we went back to normal, we'd be in trouble. <laughs> mm. And we also focused on mental illness uh, and not on mental health. And part of the challenge that we have in COVID at the moment is that uh, we have a, a big increase in mental ill health. It isn't quite mental illness, uh, as well as challenges in mental illness. So we need a mental health system and a mental illness system and a substance use system. So we need all of those things put together and coordinated. And that's not something that we had before. I'm going to ask uh, my friend Tony Burke to bring up board number two here, just as we remind everybody what this current Ontario government, when it was running for office back in 2018, promised on that regard. Uh, the PC said, the fact is too many people who struggle with mental illness and addiction don't know where to turn. They feel left behind far too often. Help just isn't there when they need it. Instead of getting help, they're put on a waiting list. That means problems just get worse. They can't work. Many end up on the street or in the hospital. Others suffer in silence. Quam, I'm guessing there's not a single, there, uh, not a single thing there, rather, that you couldn't sign on to and say, yep, they've got that pretty well figured out. Now, admittedly, they made that promise before the pandemic hit, and they've had other financial commitments to have to fulfill since then. But given that that's what they've got on record, how hopeful are you that things are going to improve once we get a handle on this pandemic? Well, I, I, I hope that things are going to improve. Obviously, uh, one of the commitments that the uh, Ontario government had was $3.8 billion that they were going to put into mental health, $1.9 billion coming from the feds and $1.9 billion that they were going to put in themselves over 10 years. Now, uh, that's not going to be enough to get us the mental health system that we need, uh, but it, it is extra money and it's money that uh, has been agreed and I believe that they're still moving forward uh, on it. Uh, the question uh, for me is how we balance uh, not just a, a mental illness system, but also a mental health system and we think about wider social policy and also how we um, think, well, we could just leave this to the province. Uh, but actually, we want the city involved. We want our cities involved. Uh, we, are, we also want the uh, feds involved. Uh, we want business involved. We want the third sector involved uh, because, you know, we know that workplace mental health is important and we know that the third sector, as in the charity sector and also social services, uh, do supports for people with mental health. Uh, we need the housing sector involved as well. Uh, and my question is, how do we bring all of those things together? Uh, because uh, the provincial government uh, looking on the service side is interesting, but the problems we have are much wider than that. And uh, we need everybody involved uh, and really led by people with lived experience of mental health problems and their families uh, in trying to coordinate services that meet, meet people's needs. Well, with just a few minutes left here, I wonder if this is a, an, an idea that might be helpful. Uh, you know that uh, there's a web portal for getting a vaccine. There's a web portal if you needed your wages topped up. There's a web portal for people to uh, promote business ideas about how to be helpful in creating people. Anyway, there's lots of web portals out there for different ways to make a contribution on this issue. How about an online portal that helps direct people to the mental health services they need? Would that be useful? Uh, yes, it would definitely be useful. I'll take one step back and say uh, that one of the things that Wellesley Institute we've been uh, talking about is a social contract for mental health, and that's on the web, and that might be something that uh, people would want to add their voice to. Um, but uh, And at the federal level, Wellness Together is a place uh, that you can go online and get access to resources. Uh, and actually uh, services and supports 
uh, that you might need. Um, and the province uh, did actually make uh, online uh, cognitive behavioural therapy free uh, through the pandemic, then people can get access there without a referral from their family doctor. Um, but that doesn't give you access to the, uh, none of these give you access to the full suite of resources that you need to be mentally healthy. And they also rely uh, on you being able to, as you say, go online, uh, understand um, what's, uh, uh, to, how to navigate the internet, uh, and to understand the um, interventions and supports that are available. And those interventions and supports may not be available in all languages, may not be available to all people, and uh, may be difficult to get if you're a person uh, who hasn't got broadband, can't afford broadband, uh, or you're not tech savvy. So I think we need a number of different strategies, uh, but certainly that uh, one number or one phone line or, or one website, um, which I, I know there was some money in the last federal budget, and I know that we already have 211 Ontario. Uh, they're there, but uh, it needs a bit more than that uh, to uh, not just get you uh, an idea of the services you want, you need, but actually get you the services uh, to your door uh, which I think uh, is probably going to work better. Well, we're always grateful when you come on our program and give us the 411 about 211. So Dr. Quam McKenzie from the Wellesley Institute and in U of T, as always, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks very much, Steve. Pleasure to be here. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, May the 5th, 2021. Tomorrow, we're gonna to turn our attention to kids' mental health during this COVID crisis, and we hope you can join us for that. I'm Steve Pakin, thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.